In this video, I'm going to go through the basics of how to use Ascoria and Goto to set up a point and click adventure game. Here's a list of the topics that I will be covering. Ascoria and its components are distributed as Goto plugins. Aside from the core engine, there are plugins for dialogue and different user interfaces. I'll be using the Simple Mouse, Simple Dialog, and Ascoria Wizard plugins for this video to hit the ground running but these can be modified or swapped out at any time to change the look and feel of your game. A few quick points about Ascoria in case you haven't used it before. Firstly, game logic is written in a custom language called Ascoria Script. It has commands for things like playing an animation, telling a character to say something, adding an object to your inventory, and conditional logic for only doing certain things when a particular game condition is met. Ascoria uses custom Godot node types for its nodes. The custom nodes define various things in the adventure game. The main node types are Scoria Rooms Each scene in your game is implemented as an Ascoria Room. This node type will be the root node of every scene. I'll refer to game scenes as rooms in the video, so a room could be a bedroom, or a street, or the deck of a ship depending on your game. Ascoria Background Nodes This node type holds the background image for your scene. Ascoria Terrain Nodes Ascoria Terrains define settings around where in the room the characters can walk. Ascoria Locations These are coordinates in your scene that you can make the characters and items in your game move to. Ascoria Items An Ascoria item is an object the player can interact with, like a room item or a non-player character. Your player character is a special type of Ascoria item. While you can create any of these nodes in your scene manually as appropriate, I'll shortly show you how to use the Ascoria wizard which takes the hard work out of setting up your game by creating and configuring these nodes for you. The last concept I want to quickly cover are global identifiers, which are also known as global IDs. Pretty much everything from items to terrains to locations can be given a global ID. The global ID is an identifier that is unique to the scene that identifies each item in the scene. This allows the developer to link game logic to the relevant item when making the game character move to a specific location for example, or picking up a certain object. The plan for this tutorial is to make a basic game to demonstrate the fundamentals of Ascoria. The project files will be available, so feel free to follow along and use this project as the starting point for learning the engine. The premise of this game is that you're a robot working on Mars. You've just found out that you're needed urgently on Saturn, however you've lost the keys to your rocket. The game will feature two rooms. The first has your rocket and some rocks. The second has more rocks and an alien creature. By talking to the creature, you'll find out that it can make you a new key if you find it something to eat. The food it wants to eat are Martian bugs, which can be found around the rocks. Find some bugs, take them to the creature, use your key, open the rocket, and you win. Some of the things this tutorial will cover are Installing the story and creating the project Creating the rooms and joining them Creating the characters Creating objects, both those that can be added to your inventory and background objects Conversations the Scoria script and game logic and cutscenes. The first thing I need to do is download Ascoria. Each plugin can be downloaded individually, but instead I'm going to use the demo game project on the dev branch, which has the latest code and bug fixes, as well as all the standard plugins included. The standard plugins are fine to get your game up and running, and can be customised using Godot's GD script if you want additional functionality to suit your specific game. Generally you download Ascoria from the Godot Asset Store, However, as Ascoria is undergoing a lot of development right now, the asset store doesn't have the latest version. Instead, I'm going to download it from github.com forward slash Ascoria. I could use git to clone the repository, but for this demo, I'm going to download the zip version and unzip it somewhere appropriate on my hard drive. To start creating my game, I'm going to run Godot and create a new project. I'll call my game Tutorial. Once Godot has set up the new project, I'm going to copy the add-ons folder from the Ascoria demo project into my game folder, which will install all the Godot plugins for me. Plugins aren't available until they're enabled, but I'll do that in a minute. When I switch back to Godot, you'll see it imports all the assets from all the files that have just been copied in. The plugins in the add-on folder are now part of the project, but they won't be active until they're enabled. The first plugin that needs to be enabled is the Ascoria Core, which is done by going into the Projects menu, Project Settings, Plugins tab, and selecting the Core plugin. 
As the Escoria Call plugin gets enabled, some errors will appear in the output window. This is expected the first time the plugin is enabled due to how Escoria interface is to go. Restart the project to clear the errors. Selecting Reload Current Project from the Projects menu restarts the project, which is a bit quicker than stopping and starting Goto altogether. Now that Escoria is running as part of the engine, I can enable the other plugins that I need for the game. I will be using the Simple Dialog plugin for Conversations, Simple Mouse for the User Interface, and the Escoria Wizard plugin to make creating game items easier. As before, go into the Projects menu, Project Settings, Plugins tab, and select the plugins that you want to enable. With the wizard plugin enabled, you'll notice that the wizard button pops up at the top of the screen. I'll be using this later. I'll create some directories for organising my game. While I could throw all the game graphics, sound and logic scripts into a single folder, it's a lot better idea to separate everything from the start to keep things logically organised as the project grows. You can use whatever folder structure suits your game. With the exception of the add-ons folder, there's no mandatory folder hierarchy. I'm going to create top level folders for inventory, characters and room data. I'll copy my prepared game graphics into these folders at the same time, but you can add new things into your project whenever you need to. In the project settings, there's a few settings you might want to change. On the general tab under window, I'll set the game resolution. For my project, I'm using 1920 by 1080. At the bottom of the general settings are all the Ascoria settings. In main, I'll need to define a game start script to tell the game what to do when it started. I'll tell Ascoria that the start script can be found in a file called startscript.esc in my game's root folder by sending it to res colon double forward slash startgame.esc. In the debug section, the log level defines how verbose logging is. Trace is handy for debugging errors but is extremely verbose. Error is a good alternative. If you're having issues that you're trying to debug, you might need to change this to trace and rerun your game to diagnose the issue. In the UI section, I'll change the inventory items path to the inventory folder that I created earlier. As inventory items can be picked up and taken between game rooms, inventory items are treated differently to other in-game objects that the player might interact with. The default transition is where you change the graphical effect that changes one room into another. I'll just leave it as is. Transitions are advanced to write as they're implemented as shaders, but there's a few standard ones like fades that ship with the engine. Ascoria won't work without a start script, so I'll set this up now. The start script will make sure the menu gets shown when the game is run, and opens the right first room, but you can also use it to do things like play a game introduction with a company logo when the game starts. I haven't discussed scripting yet, so configuring this requires me to jump ahead a little. You can use any text editor you like to create a file called startgame.esc. I'm going to use Notepad++, but any program on your computer that can create a standard text file is fine. I'll put the following lines in the file. The code under init will run automatically when your game starts. The show menu main command tells Ascoria to open the default menu that ships with the engine. Modifying this menu is out of the scope of this tutorial, but you can customise the menu to look however you'd like. The new game event, which is specified by colon new game, will run when the new game option is chosen from the main menu. The change scene command tells Ascoria to load a room called Alien Room to open my game. I'll save this file as startgame.esc in the root folder of my project to match what I had previously configured in the project settings. I won't be able to run the game until the Alien Room that I've specified is created. I'll come to that shortly. With the setup sorted, I can move on to creating my first character, which will be a robot. Characters are created as Goto scenes, but as the manual configuration for a character is rather involved, I'll use the Escoria Wizard plugin instead. Opening the wizard, you will see it has options for creating rooms, characters, and items. Inside the character creator, the first thing to change is the character's name. Any name you put in the name field, the wizard will automatically copy to the global ID, but you could change the global ID if you wanted it to be something different to the name for some reason. I'm calling this character Robot. Next is the folder where the character scene will be saved. I'll set that to the characters folder that I created earlier. The direction count is used to specify how many directions your character will have animations for. 
Escoria can support characters with any number of directions, but the wizard covers the most common use cases. The robot character has 8 directions, so I'll select the 8 direction button. You'll notice that the current direction indicator changes from showing 4 arrows to 8. The currently selected direction is highlighted. Escoria characters currently require walk, talk and idle animations to be configured, even if they are not used. This may change in the future, but for now you'll need to create each set to stop errors appearing. To create the animations, you'll need one or more sprite sheets containing the animation frames for that animation. You can use any number of sprite sheets, anywhere from one combined sprite sheet with all animation types for all directions, to an individual sprite sheet per animation type per direction. The only restriction is that for each type and direction of animation, for example, the walk animation facing upwards, that all its frames are on the one sprite sheet. I'll start by loading the first sprite sheet. The upwards walk was the one that the wizard started with by default, so I'll use that as my starting point. The sprite sheet will appear in the middle of the wizard, zoomed in so you can see the complete sheet. The zoom level can be adjusted using the slider at the bottom of the window. There's no way for the wizard to know how many frames make up the image, so the number of horizontal and vertical frames needs to be set. You can type in the text box, or use the arrows. The sprite sheet view will reflect the frame counts, as well as highlighting the frames used in this animation. Next you set the start and end frames for the animation. You can either set the start frames using the text boxes, or you can left click on the sprite sheet to set the initial frame, then right click to set the final frame. Once you've selected the frames you want to use, the preview window will start playing the animation. The default speed of 5 frames per minute is too low for this animation, so I'm going to change it to 25. You'll notice that once you've changed any settings, a store animation button appears. The current selection won't be remembered until you click store. Once an animation has been stored, the relevant direction arrow will turn green to show you that it's been configured. Next I'll click the upright direction arrow to configure the walk upright direction animation. As this uses a different sprite sheet to the one that's currently loaded, after the new one has been loaded in, I'll have to reconfigure the number of horizontal and vertical frames before I can select which ones to use for the animation. If I then choose the up left direction arrow without storing my changes, a warning box will appear to ask if I want to keep the changes or not. I'll select to keep the changes. For the up left animation I can use a shortcut. Unlike the front view of the character which isn't symmetrical, the back of the character is. So I can use the mirror animation button to use the same animation frames used for the up right animation, but mirror them horizontally to make the up left. I'll now set up the right facing animation, then mirror it to make the left facing one. Clicking the commit button each time I make a change can get tedious. I'll select the auto store animations button so any change gets stored automatically. Next, I set up the walking downwards animation, followed by down and right, then the down and left. As pointed out earlier, as the robot has a number on its torso that would look wrong if the animation was mirrored, different sprite sheets are used for the down and right and down and left animations rather than mirroring one to make the other. Now that all the walk animations have been configured, I'll move on to the talk and then the idle animations. The process for configuring these is the same as for the walk animations, so I'll speed up the video. As the idle animations are a single frame each on the one sprite sheet, I don't need to load sprite sheets between direction selections, or to change the number of horizontal or vertical frames. I just select the direction I want, then select the frame I need. Once all the animations are configured, I use the Export Character to Goto Scene button to export the character. Once it has been exported, the new player scene will be open. There are some things at this point that you might want to modify about your new character. Firstly, an ESC location has been created called Dialog Position. When using the default dialog plugin, this location determines where in relation to the character any text that they say will appear. The default for this location is 20% of the character's height above the head, but feel free to move it if you want the text closer or further away from them. Secondly, a collision box was created which determines what registers as the player when moving the mouse around or as they navigate around the screen. By default, it's set based on the largest sprites from all the sprite frames used, but you can change it if you want a tighter fit on your character. Thirdly, you may want to move the animated sprite up or down. Where the horizontal and vertical axes meet is the point that's considered the feet of the character. If 
this isn't lined up correctly, your character won't walk accurately around in-game objects. I'll leave the character as is for now, so that this can be demonstrated in the first room. I'll quickly highlight a few aspects of the character that's been created. Firstly, when the root node, which is an ESC character node, is selected, you'll see the global ID, which is the identifier that your scripts will use to reference this character. The animated sprite node holds all the animations that were just configured, with the default being the idle animation facing down. Only animations with animation frames will appear in the list. Mirrored animations will not. The collision shape is the bounding box for the character. And finally, there's the dialog position node as already discussed. At any time, I can use the main menu button to go back to the top menu of the wizard. The room creator is used to speed up the process of creating rooms for Ascoria adventure games. You could supply a room name and nothing else, and it will build you an empty room, but typically you'd want to add at least a background. The room name will be the name of the node in your scene tree. I'm going to call this room Rocket Room, as it's the room where the rocket will be. The global ID, which is what Ascoria will use to refer to the room, can be different to the room name, but it's easiest to have them the same, which is why the wizard populates it automatically. Type something different into the global ID field if you want to change it. The player scene is the character the player will control in this room. I'll use the robot that I've just set up. You would want to define a player scene, unless you're doing a first person game, without a visible player character. Enabling the room script will set up a placeholder script for the room using a template file. By itself, the template has no game logic, but it creates and configures a template ready for filling out to save you some time. Like the global ID, it's automatically given the same name as the room, but I could change it to something different if I wanted. The background image is used to specify the image that you would like to use for your room. I'll point it at the background file copied in previously. The room folder parent is the directory in my project where all my rooms will be saved to. The room I'm about to create will be created in a subfolder of this directory. Click Create when everything's ready to go. Looking in my folder structure, I can see it's created a folder for my room with folders for objects and scripts. If you don't want to use the objects folder, just remove it and put your room graphics somewhere else. There's also a scripts folder for the game logic. It looks empty because the score of scripts use a .esc naming convention, and the Godot file browser only shows files that Godot natively recognizes. If I open the script browser and search for all files, I can see and open the room script that the wizard has created for me. Like the objects folder, if you don't want to use the scripts folder you can remove it. Just be aware that the room has been configured to use the template file that the wizard has placed in there, so you'll have to reconfigure the room script setting of the ESC room node to point at the location of any alternative script. Room scripts contain some special setup and ready events in the file, which I'll explain when I configure some game logic for the room. Opening the actual scene that's been created, the parent is an ESC room node, with the room script and player scene already configured based on the settings that I chose in the wizard. The ESC background node contains a background image. The ESC terrain node, called walkable area, already has a navigation polygon created, which will be used by my character to navigate around the room. The polygon needs to be drawn for the navigation to work, which I'll do in a minute. You can have multiple terrains in your room and swap between them as necessary, changing where the player can walk at any particular time. An example of when you'd use this is when there's a locked door blocking access to half the room. The initial terrain would only allow the player to walk up to the door, but not through it. Then a second terrain would be activated when the door was open, and include both sides of the door. Continuing on, the room objects node is there to act as a folder for any objects in the room that the player will interact with. Any objects I create will be children of this node. Lastly, there's an ESC location node called Start Pause. This will define where in the room the player will start, unless the game logic tells the scorier to start them from somewhere else. If I had doorways on the left and right hand side of the room, for example, I need a location for each door, so I could tell a scorier to start the player at one of the particular doorways, depending on which door they were supposed to enter through. The wizard will create the start position in the middle of the room, and I'll move it later. The default start location for the player can be called anything you like, it just needs to be an ESC location node and have its is start location parameter checked. A scorer uses the navigation polygon to work out where the player can walk to. Anywhere inside the polygon can be reached by the player, anywhere outside is inaccessible. The first thing I'm going to do is create the navigation polygon. Selecting the navigation polygon instance node, the toolbar at the top of the screen changes to add some buttons for interacting with the polygon's vertices. Clicking the button with a plus allows me to place a vertex every time I click. For now, I'll make the polygon the size of the ground of the background image. Click the first point that you created to finish the polygon. If I click the Play Scene button now, my character is placed at the starting location. 
With the simple mouse interface, clicking the right mouse button changes the action type and the left button actions it. With the action set to walk, which is the foot icon, if I click around the room, my player will walk to where I click. You'll notice that the feet don't end up exactly where I click the mouse. To fix this, I'll close the window to stop the game, then open the player scene. As discussed earlier, to move correctly around the room, the character's feet have to line up with where the horizontal and vertical axes meet. I'm going to click the first child node of the EC player, then use shift click to select the last. With all the child nodes selected, I can now click the move node button, then move the character so that its feet line up with where the horizontal and vertical axes meet. I'll save the player scene, open the room again, play the scene, and now the robot walks correctly to the location I clicked. If I click in the sky, the robot will only walk as far as the navigation polygon allows it to go. You'll notice that the robot looks a bit strange as it doesn't shrink as it moves away into the distance. Let's fix that. Just before I do, I'll demonstrate that if I try to play the game using the standard play button, I can show the menu, but hitting the new game button results in an error. This will be rectified once I've covered scripting, and I'll continue to use the play scene button instead in the meantime. For now I just want to show that the interface is showing me the error in the debugger. You can get to the debugger window by pressing the debugger button at the bottom of the screen. I can change the output window to see a more user-friendly version of the error, which tells me that the reason the game won't start is that the alien room can't be found. This makes sense because the room doesn't exist yet. The reason it's looking for the alien room is because that's what I told it when I configured the game settings right at the start of this tutorial. If at any time you're looking at a code window and you can't see your game, click the 2D button to return to the 2D view where you'll see your current scene. You'll also notice that there's a stop and a pause button showing in the corner. That's because the game is still running in the background, but hung in an error state. Hit the stop button to stop the running game. Scoria can dynamically change the game character's height based on where they are in the scene. Looking at the ESC terrain node in the room, there are parameters that set the minimum and maximum scaling amounts for the room. To scale the characters in a room, Scoria uses a grayscale image the same size as your background. The colour where your character is determines what its height will be. The closer the colour is to black on the image, the more Scoria will scale items towards the minimum scale. Similarly, the closer the colour is to white, the more Scoria will scale towards the maximum scale. I've set up an image that fades from black to white, with the black being on the horizon and white at the bottom of the screen. To set the scaling for the room, drag the scaling image onto the scales property and set the scales min and maximum properties accordingly. I'm now going to play the scene again and you'll notice that the character will resize smoothly as I travel around the scene. In this room, I think the character is too small at the smallest point and not big enough at the bottom of the screen. By setting the scale minimum value to 0.8, on the horizon they'll be 80% of their regular height. Setting the scale max to 1.5 makes the character 150% of their regular height when they're closest to the player. The player's speed also changes based on how small they are on the screen so I could change the speed multiplier if I felt they were walking too quickly or too slightly. I'm happy with the walking speed, so I won't change this value. If I play the scene again, I can verify that the heights are now what I want them to be. My scene's currently looking a bit bland as there's nothing to interact with. I could drag sprites onto my scene background, like a moon into the sky for example, just to add some interest, but a scoria won't be able to interact with anything I drag onto the scene, and it will be like they're a part of the background. To be able to interact with an object, at minimum, it needs to be an ESC item node with an associated collision polygon, so that Godot knows when your mouse is over it. To create a scene object, click the Escoria wizard button, go back to the main menu, then select the item creator. The item creator can create two types of items, background objects and inventory objects. Inventory items can be picked up by the character and are stored in a different folder in your project, but otherwise, both background and inventory objects are pretty much the same. The first thing I'll create is the rocket for my scene. I can't collect it, so I'll make sure the background object type is selected. There's an important note in the text that unlike the character and room creators which create separate scenes for the things that you create, an object is a collection of nodes and will be created under whichever scene tree node is currently selected in your scene. Looking at the scene tree, the walkable area is currently selected, so if I create my rocket now, it will end up underneath the navigation polygon. If I did this and created the item in the wrong spot, I could easily just move it later. To do it right the first time, I'll select the Room Objects node first, as that's the node that I want to group my objects under. Clicking the scene tree took me out of the wizard, so I'll just click the wizard button to go back where I was. 
Like the other wizards, the global ID will mirror any name you give the object by default. I'm happy to leave the global ID and name the same. I'm going to call this object Rocket. I'll leave Interactive checked. If I turned it off, the mouse would ignore the object until such time as the script made it interactive. Clicking the default action drop down, you can see the list of standard actions that the default interfaces provide. The selection here tells the score which action you want to be the default when you right click the object. Look is fine for this one. I use the change image button and find the picture of the rocket. The preview window changes to show you what the object will look like, scaled to fit the window. Lastly, click the create object button to create the rocket. Looking in the scene tree, you'll see that there's now a rocket item inside the room objects node. The parent node is an ESC item. Underneath this is an ESC location called interact position. This position defines where the player will walk to when you do an action like Use on the item. Next is the collision shape. When the mouse is over this polygon, a scoria will interact with the object. Finally, there's a sprite which is the actual image that you'll see on the screen. Clicking the new object takes us back to the 2D view. You can see that the new ESC item has been placed at coordinate 00. I can either use the Move tool to move the rocket to where I think it should be in the scene, or I can use the Transform Position parameter to set the coordinates by hand. For now, I don't want the player to face a certain direction when they interact with the rocket as I'll be setting that later, so I'll unselect Player Orients on Arrival. When the player interacts with the rocket, I want them to be near the door, so that's where I'll move the Interaction Location node to. The default collision shape for any object you create is a rectangle that's the full size of the sprite. If your object is rectangular, or close enough to, you can just resize this rectangle so it covers where on the sprite the object is. If however, like with this rocket, a rectangle doesn't approximate the item shape, I'll need to change the collision polygon. To do this, you select the Collision Shape 2D node, then the down arrow next to the shape property. If you want to use a simple shape, a capsule, circle or rectangle for example, just choose them from the list and use the handles that appear in the 2D view to set the size of the shape, then move it over the right location on your sprite. Instead, I want to match the collision area to the outline of the rocket to be precise about when the mouse is over it, so a collision shape is the right node type to use. To change it, I'll right click the node and select change type from the menu. A collision polygon 2D is the node to change it to. I used the create points button as before to draw a polygon around the rocket, but the button won't work while I'm in move mode. Click the select mode arrow, followed by create points, then use a series of clicks to create a shape that matches the rocket's outline. If you make any mistakes, you can use the Edit Points button to move the vertices around, or just click and drag a point. If you need more points, just click on one of the polygon's edges, then drag to create a new vertex for the polygon. If you want to remove the vertex, right click it. Once you're happy with the polygon shape, clicking any other node, or pressing the Escape key, will stop you editing the polygon. Running the scene, the player starts in the middle, where the ESC location called Start Pause was located. If I move the mouse over the rocket, the rocket will become the active item in the user interface, as well as the lookout action, which I chose as the default action for the item in the wizard. Left clicking the rocket will perform a lookout, but nothing happens as I haven't told Escoria what to do when you try and look at the rocket. Next, I'm going to use the wizard to create the first of three rocks to fill in the scene. I want the player to interact with the rocks from the side and face them during the interaction. To do this, I'll move the rocks interact position to the side. Interaction directions aren't an angle. ESC characters have a table called Dir Angles, which has an entry for each direction the player can face. It maps the 360 degrees the player can walk in to the correct animation. For the character to face left, I need to find the entry in the table matching 270 degrees. Table entry 6 starts at 249 and goes for 45 degrees, which means it will include 270. Therefore I'll use 6 as the interaction direction for the rock. If you want to duplicate an item you've already created, you can right click the parent ESC item node, choose duplicate, and then move the copy somewhere else in the scene. Both objects can share everything including their behaviour script, but every Escoria specific node in the scene must have its own, unique, global ID. 
If you forget to change the global ID when copying room items, when you play the scene, it will error and tell you that there is an object with that global ID already registered. To fix the global ID error, I'll go into the second rock and change its global ID to rock 2. Next I'll fix rock 3's global ID. Now when I play the scene, there's no error. As I walk around the scene, two problems become apparent. Firstly, the robot is not being drawn behind the rocks when they should be. Secondly, the robot walks through the rocks rather than around them. I'll use the 2D view to fix these issues. Goto's 2D mode has a concept of Z-ordering. The Z-coordinate is how far into the screen an object is. The lower the number, the further away it is. Objects with a higher number will be drawn in front of objects with a lower one, giving your room the illusion of depth. The robot's Z-value is determined by where its feet are in relation to the background, in other words, its Y-coordinate. Room objects, however, are created with the default Z-value of 0, so will always be drawn behind the robot. To work out the right Z-value for the rock, I need to know where the bottom of its sprite is. The easiest way is using Goto's ruler. If I click and drag down from the top ruler, Goto will draw a guide on the screen. By taking a note of the coordinate shown on the left hand side of the screen when the guide is in line with the rock, I'll know the correct value for its Z parameter. 777 is the lowest coordinate for the first rock, so that's what I'll use for its value. By moving the guide around, I'll get the values for the second and third rock and set their Z index accordingly. Testing the scene, the robot now walks behind the rocks, but unfortunately can still walk through them. The terrain polygon determines where the player can walk. By creating holes in the polygon, parts of the room are made unreachable, forcing the player to walk around them. To create holes, I select the navigation polygon, select create points, then draw around anything the character shouldn't be able to walk through. I'll also take the opportunity to move the terrain in a bit from the edge to keep the player from walking into objects placed right at the edge of the room. When creating navigation polygons, don't put the polygon's edges too near to objects or the edges of rooms, or your character might appear to walk on or through things that they shouldn't. Now when I rerun the scene, the character successfully navigates around all the objects in the room. If I use left click to perform a look at action on one of the rocks, nothing will happen. Even though I've defined an interaction position and direction, the look interaction hasn't been coded yet. In a little while when I talk about scripting, I'll make the robot say something when I choose to look at the rocks. Lastly, I'll move the start pause next to the rocket, as that's where I want my robot to start when I start my game. I'll speed up the creation of the second room, as it uses all the same techniques as the first. Go to the room creator in the wizard, Give the room the title of Alien Room. Set the player scene to the robot. Enable the room script. Give the room the same background as the first room and create the room. The player will be walking in from the right, so I'll set the start location to the top right hand corner. I'll add the Alien House, Rocks and Table as sprites by clicking and dragging them into the scene. If you wanted, you could create them as ESC items so you can interact with them, but I'm going to keep them as background sprites to limit the complexity of the tutorial. The next step is to set up the navigation polygon so that the player can walk around and not through all the objects, as well as the scaling bitmap. Now that there's two scenes, there needs to be a way to troll between them. There's a few ways to do this. For simple exits that just swap the player from one scene to the next, there's a node type called ESC Exit. You give it a collision shape, tell it which room you want the exit to connect to, and when the player stops walking on that collision shape, they'll be sent to the appropriate scene. For more complex game logic, for example, if you need to configure that a door is unlocked before letting the player use it and tell them it's locked otherwise, you'll need to use scripts. I'm going to set up ESC exit nodes at this point as they're the easiest. To create an ESC exit, I right click the room objects node, click add child node, then type ESC exit in the search box. Double click ESC exit to create it.
I can either double click or press F2 with the node selected to rename it. I'll rename the node to Rocket Room for clarity and give it a global ID of Rocket Exit just to show that the global ID doesn't have to be the same as the name. I'll use the folder icon next to the target scene parameter to configure the room that this exit will send the player to. In the scene tree, the new node has a yellow warning icon next to it. Hovering over the warning to see the reason, Godot tells you that it needs a collision polygon associated with the node. To fix this, I'm going to right click it, add child node, and start typing the word collision to find the collision shape 2D node type. I could also use a collision polygon for complex shapes, but I only need a standard rectangle for this one. The collision shape 2D node now has a warning icon. Hovering over it tells me that it needs to know which shape type I want to use. I'm going to click the shape and select the rectangle from the list. The arrow icon has now disappeared, but the shape needs to be placed in the scene to match the part of the scene which should send the player back to the first room. The edges of the collision polygon shape are indicated by the pinkish handles in the 2D scene. Clicking and dragging these resizes the polygon, while clicking and dragging moves it. Now that it's where I want it, there's one more thing to change. On the ASC exit node, as well as a lot of other Ascoria nodes, there is a parameter called tooltip name. In this case, I'm going to use the tooltip name Go East. This is the text that will be shown to the player when they hover over the polygon in game, so they have context of what will happen in that spot. I'll now follow the same steps to add an ESC exit to the first room. You can swap back to the first room scene by clicking its tab. Alternatively, I could also double click the scene in the file browser to open the scene if it wasn't already open. I'll repeat the process I used a minute ago to create an ESC exit. I'm going to select the room objects node, add child, type ESC exit, and double click. Rename this node if you feel like it. Set the scene you want the exit to link to. Give it a collision shape 2D child, set it to be a rectangle in shape. Resize and move the rectangle. And give the tooltip the name Go West. I'll now play the game from one of my two scenes. When I move my mouse over the collision polygon, the description text will change to match the tooltip that I set up. Click this area to make the player walk to the exit. Going to the exit in each room swaps the player to the scene that I configured on the exit node. You might have noticed a small problem when using the exits to swap between the two scenes. The AEC exit has no way to know which location to send your player to in the destination room, so by default it will send you to the starting point. That's fine for room 2 as there's only one entrance to the room, so defaulting to the starting position is fine, but in room 1 our starting pause is in the right spot to start the scene, but the wrong spot to work with the exit. To fix this, I'll need to set up a simple script for the room, so that in the first room you start the game next to the robot, but when you re-enter the scene, you'll appear on the left hand side. Let's create some game logic. Score your scripts to find the game logic for your game, and are attached to the item they relate to. You can use any text editor that you like to create the scripts, as long as they can create plain text files. The scripts can be given any name as long as they have a .esc extension and live in any directory that's inside your project. When you select nodes like ESC items or ESC rooms, these nodes will have an ESC script property that you use to link them to their script. Ascoria scripts follow the basic format of an event keyword followed by a set of commands that relate to the event. The sample interface plugins like Nineverb and SimpleMouse will implement the different interactions. Example interaction types are walk, look, pick up, use, and talk. Modifying the user interface is outside the scope of this video, but the idea is that you would modify one of the sample interfaces to make it suit your game. As part of this, you might want to implement other verbs, like sniff or kick, for example. In this instance, you'd then be able to use these verbs that you'd added as the event keyword in your script. The list of commands available to use can be found on the Ascoria website in the ESC language command reference. I'm going to start by creating a script for my rocket. I'll use Notepad++ as my script editor, but use any program on your computer that will create a standard text file. The first thing I want to do is tell the game what to do when the player looks at the rocket. To do this, 
I'm going to start with the keyword look. As it's an event keyword, prefix it with a colon. Any Ascoria script commands that follow the keyword will then run until such time as either another event keyword is found or the stop command is processed. When the player looks at the rocket, I want to tell Ascoria to do two things. The first is that I want the character to face the player, which is the same as facing them in the down direction, and then I'm going to tell the player that the rocket is locked and that I don't have the key. To do this, I'm going to use a couple of different commands. To set which way the robot will face, the command to use is set angle. If I look at the format of the set angle command, I can see it takes a few parameters, object, target, degrees, and an optional weight parameter. In my script then, I'll put set angle for the command that I want to action. The object will be the global ID of the object that I want to change the angle of. I set the character up with a global ID of robot, so I use the word robot as the object parameter. Next comes target degrees, which I'll make 180 so that the player faces down, and I'm happy to leave weight unspecified as it says the default of zero is an immediate turn. Next I want the player to say something, so I'll use the say command. Looking at the documentation again, following the command say comes the character to say the text. As before, the global ID of the character that I want to say the text will be the robot. As the character to say the text is the robot, its global ID is the parameter that comes next. Ascoria will also allow you to use the keyword current player as the global ID of the character who will be saying the text. I use current player as then it's not confusing if my game at some future point added another robot. Lastly comes the text that I want the robot to say, so I'll put some quotes followed by the line, that's my rocket. After the robot finishes that line, I'd like them to say another line to reveal more of the game context to the player, so I'll put another say command with, it's locked and I don't have a key. The final script should look like this. When I save the script, as mentioned earlier, the file can go anywhere inside my project. To keep things logically organised, I'm going to put it in the room scripts folder, which the wizard conveniently created for me. I find it easier to store scripts with the rooms they relate to, making them easier to find later, but the location's up to you. As mentioned previously, the file will have a .esc extension to indicate that it's an Ascoria script file. I'm going to call it rocket.esc, as that's going to be easier to find later than some random name like myreallycoolscript.esc. Now I have a script, but I have to link it to the rocket so the lookout action does what I expect it to. To do this, I select the rocket node and use the little folder button next to the ESC script parameter to locate and select the script that I just created. Starting the scene now, I need the look command, so I'll right click until the magnifying glass icon is the active one. When I left click on the rocket, the robot automatically walks to the rocket's interaction location, faces the camera, and says the two lines from the script. If I decide that I don't like where the robot walked to, I can modify it. Back in the Godot editor, I just choose the EC location that's the child of the rocket node, and use the move tool to move it where the robot should walk to. The important thing to check here is that the location is within the navigation polygon. If it's not, say if I put it up in the sky for instance, the robot won't be able to reach the destination when I try to run the look command on the rocket and the game will error, so make sure the location is somewhere reachable. I'm now going to add a second interaction to the rocket. Reopening its script, I'll put the pickup event keyword, prefix it with a colon to tell the score that it's an event. If the player tries to pick up the rocket, I want the robot to say that it's not possible, so I'll add a say command to the interaction Current player will be the object saying the line, and the text will be, that's too heavy to pick up. Running the game, I can look at the rocket as before, but I can also right click to get to the pick up icon, the one which looks like a hand, then click on the rocket to try and pick it up. The robot will now run the script commands under the pick up event, and tell the player that the rocket is too heavy. Ascoria script commands are a mix of blocking and non-blocking commands. Blocking commands have to complete before the next command in the list starts, whereas non-blocking commands will start, and while running, the next command in the list will kick off. For commands with blocking and non-blocking versions, the blocking commands will have the word block as part of the command name. Generally when a player enters a room, you'll want to run some setup on it. You may want to play a cutscene for example before the player gets control, or you might want to enable or disable certain objects based on puzzles that the player has completed. This is where room scripts come in. A room script is attached to your ESC room node and has a couple of special events that you can script commands against. When you switch between events or open the first scene, the scene script is open and any commands in the setup event are run. 
When the setup event runs, the room is not visible at this point. When all commands in setup have completed, the graphical transition will run and the room will be shown. The transition is a graphical effect that displays the new room in some way, for example, by performing a fade in. The transition type can be set to instant if desired, so that the screen switches straight away from the previous room to the new one. When the transition is complete, commands in the ready event are run. Once the ready event completes, control is handed to the player. If you want to set the state of objects based on puzzles, for example, displaying a trophy in a locked cabinet, or drawing the cabinet open with the trophy gone, this would happen in the setup event before the player sees the room. If however you want the player to walk to the cabinet and say, someone's stolen the trophy, when they come into the room, the walk and say commands would go into the room's ready event so that they happen when the room is visible. Rooms do not require a script, and if they have a script, they don't require both the setup and ready events to be specified. When you create a room with the Ascoria wizard, it will automatically create a room script with empty setup and ready events and assign it to the room, otherwise you'd have to set this up manually. If not required, these can be left empty or removed entirely. Variables will be an important part of your game's logic. A variable is a name that represents a value, a string of characters, or a true-false condition that you want the game to remember. Variables are global in scope, which means that once you assign a value to a variable, you'll be able to query or change its contents from any scene in your game. Variables can be set at any time in your game in any script. The plan for my game's bug puzzle is that you can't find the bugs in the rocks until you've talked to the alien. I'll implement this later, but the theory is that I'll have a variable called talk to alien. Initially this will be set to false, but will be set to true once you've talked to the alien. If the player looks at a rock, and the talk to alien variable is currently false, no bug will be found. If, however, they look at the rock and the talk to alien variable is set to true, it will be possible to find the bugs. Creating a variable is as simple as using the setGlobals command and passing in a name for the variable and a value. I'll be setting variables with the setGlobal command for the game's logic as part of creating the alien non-player character. Back to the issue of swapping between the two rooms in this project. When you leave the alien room and re-enter the rocket room, the character doesn't start on the left-hand side of the screen like they should. Understanding how room scripts and variables work, this can now be fixed. The first thing that's needed is an ESC location in the rocket room where the player should be placed when they arrive. In the rocket room, I'm going to select the room objects node, right click and choose add child node. Start typing the word location, then choose ESC location from the list. I'll right click the node and choose rename, then rename it to alien room entry to differentiate it from any other locations that I might later create in the room. The global ID is how the game scripts will recognize the location so I'll set it to Alien Room Entry for clarity. I'll use the Move tool to move the location to where I want the player to be positioned when coming into the room. Opening the room script assigned to the rocket room, I'm going to edit the setup event and add the following lines. I'm going to step through this to discuss what the commands are doing. The greater than sign tells the score that we're going to run some checks of the things in the square brackets, and if they're true, we'll run the following code. In this case, the EQ command says that we're going to see if the two following things are equal. ESC last scene is a special variable which holds the name of the last scene that the player was in. The first time you enter the scene, the logic will execute and check the last scene you were in. As the last scene was an alien room, the indent commands will get skipped and the player will be placed by default in the room starting location. Later, when you come into the room from the alien room, however, ESC last scene will now equal alien room which means the check between the square brackets is true, and the following commands will therefore run. In that instance, the teleport command places the player on the location of the node with the global ID, alien room entry. If there were any other commands that were non-indented after the teleport command, these would get run regardless of whether the last scene was alien room or not. If you didn't want this to happen, you need to place a stop indented after the teleport command, which would stop any other commands in the script from being evaluated. Running the game from Alien Room and walking to the Rocket Room, the player is now placed in a position that makes sense. In your game, it takes a lot of time to set up unique actions for every item. The default actions file allows you to set up some defaults that a scorer will use unless you specify otherwise. For example, you could set it up so that when you try and use any item, the player will default to saying, I can't use that. To do this, I'll first have to create a file to act as the defaults file. The defaults file will have each action you want to default for, preceded by a column. 
After each action, add the commands you want to run by default for that action. Typically the character is saying something like, I can't use that, I can't pick that up, I can't walk there, etc. I could add default actions for other things the player might do, like look or pick up if I liked, by adding them to this file. I'm going to save this file to the root folder of my project as action defaults.exe. To configure a scorey to perform these actions as the default, I need to go back into the scorey configuration in Godot's project settings. In the Scoria main section, there's a setting called Action Default Script. I'll set it to res colon double forward slash action defaults .ac so that it points to my file. And now any time I try to use an item that doesn't have a use interaction configured, the robot will say, I can't use this. I'll set up two different types of animations, the first type to play on demand, the second type of background ones that run by themselves. Firstly, the interactive animation. The interactive animation will be controlled by game events. It can be started or stopped by script, and its state will be stored in save games. My interactive animation will be a flashing sign on the side of the hut. In the normal state for the game, there will be a sprite showing the sign turned off on the side of the building. But by drawing a lit up version over the top of it intermittently, I'll create a flashing sign effect. The player will interact with the sign switch, which will trigger the animation to start. I'll start off with the power switch. I'll select the Room Objects node, and then use the wizard to create a background object. The item name will be Switch, the default action will be Use, and the graphic will be the Switch. Once I've created the object, I'll select it and move it onto the table. The interact position I'll move next to it. Now that the switch is created, two animations are required. The first one is the on animation for when the sign is turned on. This animation will have looping turned on so that it restarts as soon as it completes. The second is the off animation, which will change the picture to a static, unlit graphic and stop. To create these animations, I'll right click the switch node and add an animated sprite child node. Highlighting the warning that appears, I can see I need a sprite frames resource. To do this, I go into the Frames property and click New Sprites from the drop-down. Now I need to create the actual animations in the Animation Editor. The easiest way to get to the Animation Editor is to select any other node in the node tree, then click on the Animated Sprite node again. This opens the Animation Editor down in the bottom of the interface. On the left-hand side of the Editor is the list of animations associated with this animated sprite. There's currently only one animation, called Default. By left-clicking it, I can change its name. I'm going to call the first animation Sign Off. By dragging and dropping the unlit sign sprite onto the animation frames part of the editor, I've now created an animation with a single frame, and you can see it has appeared in the 2D interface where the switch is located. I'll turn off the loop parameter so that running this animation just displays the unlit sign sprite and then stops. I'll then use the Move tool to move the sign to somewhere appropriate on the side of the building. Now that that's done, I need an animation for when the sign is lit. I could make a single lit frame, like the turned off animation, but I'll make it flash so it's a bit more interesting. I'll start by clicking the plus icon to add a second animation. Clicking the second animation, I can rename it to sign on. I'll drag the lit sprite frame, followed by the unlit sprite frame into the interface. When the animation executes, each frame will be shown in order at the speed shown in the FPS box. As the looping button is enabled, the animation will continue to play indefinitely once it has been started. From the FPS box, the animation is currently set to run at 5 frames per second, which means that as I have 2 frames in my animation, the sign will flash 2.5 times a second. It's hard to know if this is a good speed or not without seeing it, so in the Animated Sprites Properties, I'll select the animation as the Sign On animation, then click the Playing button to activate it. I'll change the FPS setting to 3, as I think it's flashing a bit fast. The animation that's chosen in the Animation Property will be the default one that will start when the game starts, and I don't want the sign to start running so I'll change the animation back to the sign off animation and turn off the playing button. The last thing I need to do is link the animation to the button, and to do this I'll need a script. I'll put the following into a text file. I'll now save my script as sign.esc in the scripts folder. Stepping through the script, the script says, if the switch on variable is false, then I want to use the set state command to play the sign on animation for the switch esc item. After this, I want to set the switches on variable to true to indicate the player has turned the sign on. I then want to stop the script, or else the next few lines will immediately turn the sign back off again as their check that the switches on variable is true will now evaluate to true and execute. 
to do this I use the stop command. A couple of things I'll quickly point out about the script. The first is a reminder that all variables will evaluate to false until you set them otherwise. This lets me check the status of the switches on variable before a command has ever run to set its value. The second thing I'll point out is that by using the set state command to run the animation instead of the anim or block anim commands, the state of the switch will be restored when you load and save the game. I could also run animations that used a Goto animation player rather than an animated sprite if I wanted to. While animation players are really powerful in Goto, they're also more complex to explain, so I've used the easier animated sprite instead. Now the first animation is done, I'll move on to the non-interactive animation. The non-interactive animation will use a normal Goto animated sprite to add some twinkly stars in the background that won't react to anything in the game, or any input from the player. No Ascoria coder objects are created for this, just placing an animated sprite node in the scene results in Goto running it automatically when the scene is opened. To create the twinkling stars, I right click room objects and add an animated sprite node. I right click the node and use rename to rename the sprite to stars. Selecting the frames property, I select new sprite frames. I'll enable playing so that I can see my animation as I create it. If I then click the sprite frames, the animation editor will open automatically. I'll click and drag the individual sprite frames onto the animation editor to create the animation. Now all I need to do is use the move tool and move the animation to where I want in the background and the animation is done. Like the animated sprite, some of the native Godot types, like particle effects, can be placed in the room and will function as expected without any Ascoria nodes or scripts. It wouldn't be much of a game without someone to talk to, so I need to create a non-player character, otherwise known as an NPC, a character who is in the game but isn't the player. Normally, an NPC would have the ability to walk around your scenes if the story required it, but in this game the only one will stay behind their table and won't do anything much. They will have idle and talk animations, but only facing in the one direction. The wizard will let me create a one direction character, so I'll use that. Opening the wizard, I'll go to the character creator, use alien as both the name and global ID, and select the one direction character. For the downwards talk and idle animations, I'll use the sprite sheets that I copied in at the start of the video. The NPC won't walk anywhere, so I'll just use a single animation frame for the walk animation. It could be anything at all as it will never get used. Once I've created the alien, I need to import them into the alien room. To do that, I'm going to find the character scene that was just created in the file tree and drag it into the scene. I'll open its scene and move the interact position to the right so that the player talks to the alien from that side. Save the scene to store the changes. In order to have a conversation, the alien needs a script to tell the game what to do when you interact with it. I'll create a new script in my text editor and paste in the contents that I've already prepared. There's a lot in this script, so I'll step through it a section at the time. It starts with the talk verb, so everything under it will run when the player talks to the alien. The next three lines will run every time you start a new conversation with the alien. Once the alien has greeted the player, following this is a question mark. This tells the dialogue plugin that this is a conversation. Every option that is one tab indent in and started with a hyphen will be shown to the player. This means that the player will get the options, what is your name, I'm locked out of my rocket, and I've got to go. While these three sentences are the options the player will have to choose from, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily what the robot will say when you click that option, just that those are the option the player can choose from. The what is your name option includes a condition in square brackets, which means that this option will only display if the condition in the brackets matches. The condition is that the name known variable is false. The exclamation mark here means false. As the name known variable isn't known yet, it's automatically false, so the first time you talk to the alien, this option is available. If you choose this option, after the two say commands, the set global name known true line will set the name known variable to true. This means that the first option will not be shown again, as it won't meet the condition that the name known variable is false anymore. If the player chooses the I'm locked out of my rocket option, after the three say commands is another question mark. This starts a different set of options for the player to choose from. At this point, they can now choose how long will it take, how much will it cost, and buy, as the options to say. As the first two options have no conditionals, that is, no square brackets with a conditional on the end of their lines, this means that if you choose either of these, they'll be shown as options again. So you could choose how long will it take, two lines will be spoken, and then that option will be available to choose again. At the end of the buy option is the stop command. This terminates the conversation and passes control back to the player. 
I'll save this script as alienscript.esc in the folder with the alien. To make this script active, I need to open the alien scene, select the parent node, then use the folder button next to the ESC script parameter to select the script I've just created. Once the scene is saved, it's all ready to go. Like with the rocks earlier, the robot's interaction position is to the right of the alien, and I'll want them to face to the left. I use the interaction direction of 6 to use the left facing talk animations when the robot talks to the alien. I'll now open the alien room scene, run it, and use the talk action to talk to the alien. By selecting the various options, I can test that the conversation setup is working as expected. I can validate things like the What is your name option disappearing after you've asked it. To change the generic speech settings, I can go into Godot settings and look in the Escoria dialogue simple section. Settings I might want to change here include how fast the text is written to the screen during a conversation, what happens if I click while the text is being written, does it speed up the text or does it complete the whole line, and the reading speed, which determines how long the text will remain on the screen after the line completes being displayed. Adventure games need puzzles. The game now has an alien who has told the player about the puzzle that they need to complete, and now I need to implement it. The puzzle plan is, searching the rocks at the start of the game reveals nothing. The robot talks to the alien. The alien tells the robot it needs to search the rocks for a bug. Searching the rocks will now lead to the robot finding the bugs. To add some replayability to the game, the bug will be randomly assigned to one of the three rocks. The robot searches the rocks and finds the bug. To keep this tutorial fairly simple, I'll put it straight in the player's inventory at this point, rather than making it something on the ground that they have to pick up. The robot gives the bug to the alien. The alien gives the robot a rocket key. The robot uses the key on the rocket, and they win the game. The first part of the puzzle is to make sure nothing is found when searching the rocks early in the game. The puzzle will only apply to any rocks in the rocket room scene, so I'll open that. To set up the puzzle, I'll start off by making a script, calling it rock1.esc, and placing it in the rock item scripts folder. Initially, all I want the rocks to respond to is the look command, so the script will be very straightforward. I'll assign the script to the first rock by updating that rock's script parameter. I won't assign it to all three rocks as each rock will get its own individual script in a minute. That ticks off item 1, and as the robot is already told to go find a bug during the conversation that I set up earlier, I can also tick off item 2. A global variable will tell Escoria which of the three rocks has the bug allocated to it by assigning it the value 0, 1, or 2 randomly. It would make sense to set the global at the start of the game, or after the alien has told the robot what the puzzle is. I'll put it in as part of the conversation with the alien to keep everything logically grouped. I'll open the alien script again and add the following two lines to the how much will it cost conversation. Here, the rand global command will give the rock with bug variable a random value of 0, 1 or 2. I'll use this to decide which of the three rocks has the bug on it. If the value is 0, then rock 1 has the bug, if the value is 1, then rock 2 has the bug, and if the value is 2, then rock 3 will have the bug. The bug can be found variable I set to true, so I can check in the rock script to see when the puzzle is active. The how much will it cost part of the alien conversation now looks like this. I'll now modify the rock script that I've just created to allow the player to find the bug. I'll quickly step through what this script does when you perform the look action on the rock. Firstly, it checks if the bugs can be found variable is true. This will only happen after talking to the alien as discussed earlier. If we haven't talked to the alien yet, it will drop straight down to the last two lines and say that there's no bugs to be found right now. If the bugs can be found, then it checks if the player is already holding a bug. The i slash bug checks to see if there's an item with the global ID of bug in the player's inventory. If there is, the player is told that they have a bug and to go to the alien. The stop command stops any further commands in the script from running, which means that the last two lines about footprints will not execute. If the player isn't already holding a bug, the script checks if the rock with bug variable equals this rock's number, which is zero in this case. If it does, we will add the bug to the player's inventory. If not, the player will be told that there is no bug here, and the script will stop. I'll save these changes, but this script will only work for the first rock, which is number 0. To make it work for the other two rocks, I'll need to create copies of the script called rock2.esc and rock3.esc, and modify the rock with bug equals 0 line to check for a value of 1 or 2, respectively. I now assign the rock 2 and rock 3 scripts to the rocks so they're ready to go. I'll test these in a minute.
Debugging is the process of finding and fixing any errors in your game that cause it to work in a way that wasn't expected. One of the easiest ways to do this is with the print statement. If you aren't sure if a particular script is getting executed, putting something like print now running the alien talk script in the script lets you validate that the game logic is correct and that the game has processed that part of the script. One of the most handy features of the print statement is the ability to print the contents of global variables so you can quickly see the state of variables in the game and make sure the set is expected for the logic to execute. In my game, to make sure things are working as expected, I'll add a command after the rock with the bug is chosen to show the developer which rock has the bug. If I then search that rock and don't find the bug, I know that there's an issue with my conditional statements that I need to investigate. I'll now run the alien room and talk to the alien. After I tell them I'm locked out of my rocket, and ask them how much will it cost, the bug will get assigned to a rock. If I use Alt tab to switch to the Godot editor while the game is running, and to look at the debugger tab, I can see that the bug was assigned to rock 0, 1 or 2. Unfortunately, if I go and check that rock, the game will error as the rock script assigns the bug to the player, and we haven't created the inventory item yet. I'll fix that now. An inventory item is an item that the player can pick up and take with them. Inventory items are just like normal objects in that they are an ESC item, but all inventory objects in your game must live in a single folder. I configured this folder at the start of the tutorial, but as a reminder, the setting can be found in Godot settings under Escoria UI Inventory Items Path. I'm going to use the wizard again to speed up the creation process. Inside the wizard, go into the item creator and select the Create Inventory Item button. The first item will be the bug. The item name and global ID will be bug, it will be interactive, the default action can stay as look, and I'll use the change image button to choose the bug picture. Lastly, I click the create inventory button to create the object. I also need to create a rocket key, change the name and global ID to key, choose the key image, and click create inventory. If I wanted to check the items, I could search for their scene in the file explorer, and open them just like any other scene. For the item to be usable from the inventory so that the player can give it to the alien, the combine when selected action is in parameter has to include use. This means that the player will use the object to give it to the alien as opposed to looking at the object or closing the object, for example. Setting the parameter to include use will be done automatically if the wizard is used to create the inventory item. For both items that I've created, I'll check the Use from Inventory Only checkbox, which tells Ascoria that you can't use this item without picking it up. In this game, you get given the items directly, so it doesn't make any difference, but it's good practice to set it up now in case I decide to change how the game works later and make them items in the scene that you can interact with before picking them up. Now that the bug inventory item exists, I will test the game, talk to the alien, go search the rocks, and check that I get given the bug. So this video doesn't drag on much longer, I'll speed it up until I get the bug in my inventory. It's always good practice to test each bit of your game as you create it, rather than trying to test everything at the end and finding that there's major problems. Now that's working, I'll add the logic to the alien to accept the bug and swap it for a key. To demonstrate cutscenes, I'm going to make a basic one when the player gives the bug to the alien. A cutscene is when some of the story is shown to the player. Like watching a movie, the player can't interact with the cutscene. A cutscene is easy to implement. You disable the player interaction, then use commands to play animations, dialogues, sounds, or whatever you need to tell that bit of the story, and then give control back to the player once the cutscene is finished. I'm going to add a few lines to the bottom of the alien script to run a simple cutscene. These should be fairly self-explanatory, but I'll run through them quickly. When you use the give command to give the bug to the alien, the game will turn off the user interface displayed on the screen, and then block all user input, except for the ability to skip through any conversations. The bug is removed from the inventory, the alien says it's line, it gives the player the key, then the robot is made to walk to the start position node, that is, the one with the global ID of rocket exit. I'll set the game complete variable to true, which I'll use to trigger a cutscene in the rocket room when the character leaves this one, as cutscenes can't cross rooms and I'll re-enable the GUI. I then change to the rocket room to show the final scene. In the rocket scene, if you have the key, I want the cutscene to continue and make the robot walk to the rocket. To do this, I'll first give the interaction location on the rocket a global ID so that I can use it in a script. I'll call it Rocket Door. 
I'm now going to modify the room script. I'll use the room's ready event so that the code only triggers once the room has displayed on the screen. I'll do a check to see if the game complete variable is set, so this cutscene won't trigger every time the player enters the room. If it is, walk the robot to the rocket, give a little finishing speech, and open the game menu to show that the game is complete. As before, I'll retest to make sure it works as I expect. To finish the game, an introductory sequence is required to start the story and give the player context about the game world and what they have to do. I'm only going to put a very basic introduction in to round out the game, but you'd want a more exciting introduction in a real game. I'm going to create a new room to act as the opening introduction. I've prepared some introductory text as a sprite which I'll use as the room's background. By making the whole screen an ESC exit in this first room, the player will see the text screen first and be able to click anywhere on it to start playing the game. In the wizard, I'll use the room creator, giving the room the name Intro Room. I won't use a player scene or a room script, and for the background image, I'll use my pre created intro sprite. When I look at the room, I don't need the walkable area as there's no character to walk around the room, so I'll right click that and use Delete to get rid of it. Under Room Objects, I'll create a new ESC exit node and give it the global ID to First Room. I'll set the target scene to the rocket room and create a rectangular collision shape that covers the whole room as a child node. I'll quickly playtest this room and make sure that clicking anywhere in the scene takes me to the game. The last thing to do is to update the main game controller to tell it that this is the first scene that I want to open when the player selects new game from the main menu. I'll reopen startgame.esc and change the new game event so that it changes into the intro room scene. I'll do a quick test using start game rather than start scene to make sure the new game button and intro scene lead into the game and I'll call that done. Well that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully this has been helpful in showing you how to put a game together using Ascoria. There are many more things that the engine's capable of. Have a look at the demo project in the Ascoria demo repository to see examples of how to implement most game functionality. Thanks for watching.